we appreciate that it's 11 p.m. in London. Yeah. London. Thanks again. Uh, we move on to the next speaker, Mr. Car uh, Carly Asiorno, if I correctly pronounced. I'm sorry if I didn't. From iSpace Technologies. So, Carly received a Master of Science in Space Studies from the International Space University. His thesis focused on the supply and demand of lunar resources. In 2015, he received the Young Space Leaders Award from the Space Generation Advisory Council. Kali is the Global Business Development Manager for iSpace Technologies. And his topic is Lunar Resource Exploitation with Swarm Rovers. Welcome. <laughs> I'm not sure what it is about space conferences, but people like to call me Kylie. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, Kyle. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. I really want to thank UNSW for putting on this conference. Uh, space mining is something that I'm really passionate about, and I feel like I'm with my family here. Uh, my name is Kyle Acerno. I'm an Italian Canadian. I studied at the International Space University, which is in France, and I worked for iSpace, which is an American company headquartered in Tokyo. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here in Sydney. Uh, I love this place. The food has been fantastic. The people are really friendly. I'm not going to comment too much about the weather. Uh, at least it's nice today, and I bought some very fashionable sunglasses, so I hope we can pull up later and try those out. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about iSpace. iSpace is what uh, the mining community would call the junior prospecting company. And um, today I'm going to talk to you about our lunar resource exploitation with Swarm Rover's path. So iSpace has one main objective, and that is to locate the resources necessary for expanding human presence in outer space. And in order to do that, we're going to follow a step-by-step -step approach. So the first step is the Google Lunar X Prize. And we have Dr. Barton here today. So I'm not going to talk to you too much about this. Uh, I'll just say that um, the Google Lunar X Prize is a private prize. And uh, you have to do three objectives. You have to land a rover on the surface of the moon. You have to travel 500 meters. And you have to send HD video back to Earth. Now, if you do that, you win the largest prize in history, which is $20 million, and that has to be completed by December 1st, 2017. iSpace actually manages Team Hakuto. Uh, we're the sole entrant from Japan, and uh, we work in partnership with the Space Robotics Laboratory at Tohoku University. Um, Professor Yoshida is our CTO. Um, he is one of the top robotic scientists in the world, and he was also a part of the Hayabusa mission that you guys heard about yesterday. Um, the Moonraker, this is, uh, this is our rover, it's called Moonraker, and it actually won a $500,000 milestone prize earlier this year. So I want to open it up and give you guys a look inside it. Um, this rover has went through extensive testing, so vibration testing, thermal testing, vacuum testing, um, and is capable of not only completing the GLXP requirements, but also prospecting and doing some future exploitation. So let me open it up here. You'll notice uh, that we recently changed from this heterogeneous architecture to a dual arm-based architecture, which has allowed us to reduce the mass, reduce the number of components, reduce the power consumption, and reduce the development time. We have four cameras on the front and the end, which gives us this 360 degree overlapping view. Uh, we also have this carbon fiber reinforced plastic at the top and bottom. And uh, for communications, we have three different types of radios. We have the 900 megahertz antenna, a one watt uh, antenna, one watt radio provided by our uh, lander, and the 2.4 gigahertz antenna. And I should say that the lander of the lander. Okay. Oh, oh, great. What did you do? Oops. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Can I get that slide? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Carl, by the way, I'll challenge you to pronounce my name. Okay. Physics. Physics. Sir, can't say that. Not exactly true. No. So we have a special design. Uh, usually planetary rovers have six wheels. We went with four wheels instead. Um, and we specifically designed these wheels for soft soils using a passive differential system uh, where the wheels are always on the ground. So these wheels are actually 3D printed. Uh, they use the Ultum, which is an amorphous thermoplastic polythermine resin, which is very good for outer space uh, because it helps with thermal elevated resistance, high strength, and stiffness. Um, and using this type of equipment, Moonraker can easily navigate the lunar, uh, the loser, lunar environment and also go up and down 30 degree slopes. So our rover is extremely light. Does anyone want to take a guess how much this thing weighs? Seven. Seven? <coughs> Four kilos. Close, very close. Four kilos, that's without uh, any scientific instruments, but right now we're down to four kilos. Now compared to our agency counterparts, we're more than 200 times lighter and a lot cheaper. And obviously, there's some pros and cons to this approach. Curiosity, in my opinion, is one of the grand achievements of humankind. It has given us amazing insight into another planetary body, but at, I think Rene, you said $2 billion, uh, that's something that is out of reach for most space agencies or any kind of private corporations. So um, one of the reasons why it is so expensive is because it's so heavy. We know that mass is a big problem, but also because of the redundancy and the risk. If you're going to spend so much money on something, it better work. Well, unfortunately for our Chinese counterparts, that didn't work out too well. That's the U2 rover over there that uh, they put on the moon a couple of, a little while ago. And um, we're not too sure actually how much it costs to produce and launch it, but it only traveled about 100 meters before it, it shut down. Uh, the Chinese responded by saying, Huo jian jian dan, yue chu nan, which means making rockets is easy, but making rovers is difficult. <laughs> Our rover, on the other hand, is uh, a little bit different. It is extremely, extremely light. Uh, we can launch multiple rovers at a time, and we can try new things. If one fails, the whole mission doesn't fail. We can learn from our mistakes, we can reiterate, reiterate we can set another one up, and uh, we can continue the mission. And I want to talk a little bit about the different kind of missions that we can do. Um, armed with some of this miniature technology that's coming out, we're talking about neutron spectrometers, X-ray fluorescence, deep penetrating radar. We can really discover a lot of these resources that Dr. Crawford was just talking about. In this next slide, I'm not going to talk 
too, too much about because you just heard all about it. And Ian Crawford was uh, someone that I researched intensely when I was doing my thesis. But um, just briefly saying that obviously there's water at the lunar poles. Um, actually, Mr. Crawford said that there could be up to 2.9 um, billion tons of water in the uppermost meter of permanently shadowed uh, craters. But that does not even include, that calculation does not include the water that we could find in these lunar uh, holes or lava tubes, which is why we need to explore these lava tubes. This is a picture from the Kaguya spacecraft from JAXA. Um, you see here, uh, this is in Lacus Mortis, the Lake of Death region. And um, that skylight is actually about 400 meters high. So it's huge. And there's a perfect ramp that goes down into there that is calling us to explore. And there's amazing things that we can find in there, uh, including potential habitable zones that we can live in in the future. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Crawford also mentioned the, the Crete porcelain train and mentioned about thorium and rare earth minerals. So uh, as we've discussed thoroughly throughout this conference, there's tons of uses for these resources, oxygen, life, you know, for in situ uh, and potentially in the future coming back to the Earth. Uh, one one uh, issue right now is that we don't have enough information. A lot of this has been done by remote sensing, so we need to get down there, we need to get some wheels on the ground, and we need to learn more. Um, so I want to talk to you about our swarm architecture and how we, we plan on doing that. We're moving away from this single, all-encompassing, gigantic rovers and moving towards more smaller rovers with limited power and limited computational power. Um, in the swarm technology community, the IR method of communication is preferred, but it imposes a distance and a line of sight penalty. So since we must explore large areas of land, we're looking towards other methods of communication. Possibly the radio, I explained before, we have this 900 megahertz radio. Uh, we're testing that to explore bandwidth, and distance, and occlusion issues that need a little bit more research. But right now, we think that we can move forward with um, th this kind of architecture where we use the lander as a central hub. So basically, the lander will commute some of the common knowledge and we use as a communication relay. Um, if in this case, we can use this adolescence technique where groups of rovers travel together. One rover stops, the other rovers move forward and then communicate with that rover, which is also sent back to the lander. So this is uh, one. Uh, system that we think it can use is it requires dynamic routing which is a little bit difficult and complex to develop but really rewarding in the end as it allows for more rovers to join the swarm as we add more and more rovers to the system also it allows us to explore these planetary caves that i talked about before where one rover goes and the next one goes in front of that and then they're communicating back to the lander so um, I've given you guys an idea of our rover, I've talked about the resources, and I've talked about the swarm architecture. And now there's one thing missing, the thing that we all love to talk about, the thing that we all need, the money. So I don't have uh, a Monte Carlo simulation, I don't really have a fancy MPV uh, model, I just want to talk to you guys about our step-by-step -step approach that we're looking at. So step one, 2017. We want to win the Google Lunar X Prize. That's a $20 million prize. Um, you might have noticed on our rover we have some advertising. So we're also con uh, using this as a way to, to make some money in the market, mainly here is the Japanese and the international market. Once we have successfully demonstrated our capabilities, we want to move more towards demonstrating our ability to detect resources and detect volatiles. Um, here we could concentrate on a neutron spectrometer, um, but we could also imagine uh, using other types of instruments uh, to do some tech demonstration and working with agency, working with the private sector. Uh, moving forward into the early 20s, we'll begin to produce larger and larger maps of the lunar surface. And um, these, this, this, these maps can be sold in data packages. We talked about this a little bit earlier, to space agencies, to research institutes, uh, to the private sector. But it's important really to monetize this data. And I'm not too sure how the scientists feel about that, but for us, we need, we need to make some money so that we can fund these, the, the further development, R&D, and pay for the launches uh, moving forward towards 2025, where we envision having hundreds of rovers on the lunar surface that are not only able to prospect, but also able to uh, moving towards exploitation of these resources. 
So I want to share with you guys a quick video and show you our rover in action. Oh, maybe it's gonna work. No. Okay, I'm just gonna have to open you two here. Can we have some? Uh, It's just a little bit of music for some emotional yeah. effect. Yeah. Tokyo for helping me put this presentation together. I'd also like to thank a lot of people in this room, Dr. Barton, Dr. Gerch, uh, Dr. Shishko, Dr. Crawford. Uh, a lot of these men and women helped me when I was uh, envisioning uh, my thesis and, and provided me with a lot of support. And a lot of the people in the room that I've talked to uh, in the past week, you've provided me with so much knowledge. I'm eternally grateful. Um, I, I just want to end by saying that we are going to do this. We're moving forward, but we don't want to go forward alone. Uh, we really need your support, we need your advice, um, and we're open to any kind of constructive criticism or uh, help that you can provide us uh, because we want to move forward as a group, we want to move forward as uh, humanity as a whole. So thank you very much. How much are you going to pay for the advice? For the advice? <laughs> 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 Hi. Hi, thanks so much for your presentation. You had a slide um, that showed that various elements could potentially be used on Earth. Um, so I'm curious how much rares would have to cost per kilo in order for that to make economic sense. Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, that's looking really, um, really, really far in the future. I really don't know. In the, there, there's some rare earth elements which are actually becoming quite scarce on Earth, and it's hard to say when it make economic sense to bring it back. Um, but I really, I really don't know. That that will be sometime 2050s, far, far future. And like Mr. Uh, Dr. Crawford mentioned, we we're going to have to have this infrastructure on the lunar surface before we can even begin to think about transporting that stuff back to Earth. Yes. How do many of you go to try them out? Uh, try them out on Earth. I mean, a lot of exploration, like in Australia, out in the Northern Territory in South Australia, we have some useful centrologists there all the time, and we can just send some rovers and fly around and take something for us. Absolutely. I mean, there's a terrestrial, uh, terrestrial aim to this. We're, we're quite a small startup, and um, the CEO really wants us to focus on the moon. Uh, focus on the mission uh, because we, you know, if we, if we spread ourselves too thin, then you end up, uh, you know, losing losing the vision. But we definitely think that there's terrestrial applications, spin in, spin off technologies, and we look forward to working with some of our terrestrial counterparts to make sure that we can uh, support each other. Yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Um, I know that the lunar regolith, uh, the, the particle is very sharp, very abrasive. Uh, what sort of um, lifespan you imagine from the moving charts, such as the, the bearings or the wheels, given that a lot of them will be out of thermal soft materials such as thermal plastics? Well, I think the, the first mission, our first mission to the, uh, to the moon will be the Google Lunar X Prize mission, and for that we need to travel 500 meters, so uh, that's not uh, as quick as you think that we're taking, that will take about five hours. But it's unlikely that that rover will be able to survive uh, any of the lunar night or anything like that. So. I think we'll, we'll be taking this step by step. So extending the life, learning from our mistakes, uh, learning from the environment, and uh, ideally creating rovers that can last longer and longer. But I, I can't really give you any definitive answers. Last question. Sure, last question, sir. Hello. Hi. I, um, we heard about lunar dust yesterday from Alice Gorman. I'm wondering um, if you're considering this and how to deal with what lunar dust can get up to. Absolutely. I mean, the abrasiveness of lunar dust is obviously a huge issue. Um, but like I mentioned, 
we want to take a step-by-step -step approach. So we want to see how our rover interacts with the dust on the first mission, learn from that, and then make the modifications that need to be uh, made for the second and third mission as we move forward. So right now it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to say. We don't have that experience like, like NASA does. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.